Ephesians 5 verse 22 to 6 verse 9, walking in spirit-filled households. We come now to what's known as the household code in Ephesians. A household code is a set of instructions to the different member groups within a traditional Greco-Roman household. In the New Testament, there are quite a few of them, and the standard groups that are addressed are husbands and wives, parents and children, and slaves and their masters. So these three main groupings. Interestingly, in the New Testament household codes, both groups are addressed, and so both halves of each pair are addressed, and often in ways that are more or less equivalent in emphasis and space given to them. By contrast, other ancient Greco-Roman household codes tended to focus almost exclusively on the obligations of the subordinate person in each of these relationships. So wives in relation to their husbands, children in relation to their parents, and slaves in relation to their owners, and tended to give minimal, if any, attention to what it meant to be a good husband, a good master, or a good parent. The household code in Ephesians, intriguingly, is connected grammatically to 5 verse 18. And I think Paul has done this for a very deliberate purpose. So 5 verse 18, if you remember, was be filled with the Spirit. And it was the, the main climactic point of the previous section about walking in wisdom. So if we push our household code all the way back to its grammatical head, we can then diagram it as per the diagram shown. Essentially, what we have is an action in 5 verse 18. Be filled with the Spirit. And then that action gave birth to a number of results, one of which was submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ in 5 verse 21. That serves as a generic heading for the entire household code. So submitting to one another becomes a framework within which Paul talks about relationships that involve authority and submission. And from then on, 5 verse 22, all the way up to 6 verse 9, these are unpacked. And there are six of them. Wives, submit to your husbands, 5 22 to 24. Husbands, love your wives, 5 25 to 32, 33 if you include the summary verse. Uh, then he moves on to children, obey your parents in 6 verse 1 to 3 and the counterpart. Fathers, do not exasperate your children in 6 verse 4. And then he turns to slaves, obey your masters, 6 5, uh, up to 6 8. And then finally, masters and a really intriguing instruction to masters, which I'll tell you about when we get there. So Paul presents one of the results of being filled with the Spirit as submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ and then uses that as a springboard to talk about these relationships between husbands and wives, parents and children, and masters and slaves. Now, the idea here is that Christ transforms people and in the process, he transforms traditional social structures, cultural values, etc. Therefore, Spirit-filled relationships between Christian husbands and wives, Christian parents and children, and in the context of the Greco-Roman context, uh, even between Christian masters and slaves, differ in significant ways from their traditional Greco-Roman counterparts because of the transformative impact of the gospel upon these. Paul's household code is significantly different from similar household codes in other authors in the centuries leading up to the first and even in the first century itself. And the body of literature on this is vast, but I want to point out just a couple of similarities and, and differences rather between Paul's household code and similar codes in the Greco-Roman world. Number one, and the standout difference between Paul's code and other similar codes is that Paul's code is framed within the understanding that Christ is Lord over all, and all are servants of Christ. So he frames his code within that assumption. This is enormously important, whereas Greek and Roman culture saw the household head as all-powerful over those under his authority, the so-called pater familias, 
Christians recognize that no human being is all-powerful over another, that Jesus is Lord over all, and that we all are brothers and sisters with Christ and with one another, and we are all servants of God. So that reframes the entire understanding of authority and submission within a Christian household and within Paul's household code. It, it's as if he's saying, husbands, your wives do not ultimately belong to you. They ultimately belong to Christ and you are to treat them as his daughters. Uh, masters, your slaves are actually servants of Christ as you are. And you would be treated in a similar way by your master to the way that you intend to and do treat your slaves and so on. So number one difference is that Paul frames his code on the understanding that Christ is Lord over all and all are servants of Christ and that that implies a mutuality and a sense of equality amongst the family of God. Number two, whereas Greco-Roman codes focused entirely on the duties of the subordinates, almost entirely, Paul focuses equally and in some cases much more substantially on the responsibilities of those in authority. So very unusual in a, a Greco-Roman household code to have anything telling you what is required of you to be a good master of a slave or a good husband. All the focus was on the other side of that equation, but not in Paul. Paul never treats husbands, fathers, and masters as sort of gods over others, but as mutually accountable servants of God. And that significantly reframes how he understands household codes and relationships. And then a third difference, the, the idea of submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ introduces in the code uh, uh, something of a mutuality that is completely lacking in the, the typical Greco-Roman household codes. We'd love to unpack that in more detail, but we don't have time. What I want to do for the rest of the time that we have is to look at what Paul says about each of the three main relationships. And because he gives most attention to wives and husbands, we will proportionately spend a bit more time there. So let's look firstly at wives and husbands, and then we're going to look at children and parents. And lastly, we're going to look at slaves and masters. Starting with wives and husbands, the, the instructions to wives and husbands are significantly longer than the instructions to the other two groups. That seemingly implies that Paul saw this as more important in the context of his message to the Ephesians. We can diagram the macro structure of Ephesians 5, 22 to 33 as shown in this diagram. We have a set of instructions in verses 22 to 24 to women, and they cohere around wives submit to your husbands with the comparison as you do to the Lord. And then from 25 to 32, there are instructions to husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church, the same comparison. And I've labeled the relationship between these two both and because the both and connection implies that two propositions are simultaneously but unexpectedly true and that they go together, that you shouldn't have one without the other. So the idea here is that it's God's expectation is both wives submit to your husbands and husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. And yeah, it's true that wives should submit to their husbands. And surprisingly to the ancient psyche, it's equally and in the context of the space given even more true that husband must also love their wives. The passage should never be used as a sledgehammer for unloving husbands to beat their wives into subjugation of any sort, which tragically does still happen. So we've got this, this both and, referring to wives first and then to husbands. And then the final verse, verse 33, is a summary of those instructions, reiterating the key points by saying once again, both husbands love and wives respect in relation to your partner. Let's look quickly at Paul's instruction to wives in 22 to 24. Despite all the controversy that surrounds this passage, controversy mostly arising out of our cultural discomfort with it, the basic structure of the passage is actually quite straightforward. And you can see it in the diagram. There is an exhortation, which is restated. 
So let me make a few observations about the diagram. The first and last verses state and restate the same exhortation. Wives, submit to your husbands as the church submits to Christ. The middle verse gives us the basis or the ground for those exhortations. Wives should submit to their husbands because the husband is the head of the church. Sorry, the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. So in terms of what Paul says to the Ephesians, the basic structure is clear. Wives submit because the husband is the head and he anchors this in the comparison to Christ and the church. What does this language of headship mean? Well, huge controversy around that in our modern literature. Uh, much, much too much debate to, to engage meaningfully here. Uh, but I want to make just two small observations. The first one is that in non-Christian household codes, the language used to refer to the husband and wife's roles was different. So Paul here yeah, uses the word the husband is the kephali, the head of the wife. In secular Greco-Roman codes, the husband was often described as archon, ruler, and in relation to the husband, the wife would be described as archomenon, the one ruled. Much stronger language than we have in Paul. Sometimes husbands were called kyrios, lord, in relation to their wives. Sometimes even the language of despotes, a despot, an all-powerful ruler. So Paul has done something intriguing here. While he retains a sense that there is structure, he softens the language quite dramatically compared to what we see in Aristotle or Exonophon and similar household codes. And he positions, in effect, the husband as part of the same body as the wife by using this imagery of, of head and body. Um, nowhere is the husband told to subjugate his wife, which is brought out in corresponding secular uh, household codes. So this idea that it's the husband's role to force his wife into subordination. The instruction here is to the wife, you submit, you order yourself under your husband. So what he's done is to drastically soften the language that we find in some of the secular household codes. And then a second observation, d despite the intentional softening of the language, we still have the language of authority and submission present as the church submits to Christ. So a spirit-filled wife submits to her husband. Paul now turns to husbands in verses 25 to 32, remembering that verse 33 is a summary of both groups. The instructions to husbands are much longer than those to wives, which is ironic because so much of the literature today is centered around the instructions to wives. Paul's emphasis is, is in the opposite place. His emphasis on what does a spirit-filled husband do in relation to his wife that's the emphasis of the passage. Now, if the language Paul uses to address wives is a gentle, subtle corrective to the excesses of Greco-Roman culture, the language he uses to address husbands is radically countercultural. It totally challenges the assumptions of husbands' roles in relation to their wives in similar codes from the secular world. He uses the language of loving service to a treasured equal instead of this language of ruler and ruled. And there's, there's no overtone in his instructions to husbands of superiority or dominance, only that of loving service patterned after Christ's self-sacrificing love for the church. So this, this language of washing and feeding and caring that Paul uses to describe a husband's gentle, tender, self-sacrificing love for his wife was radically countercultural, probably even offensive to Greek ears. Now, the diagram of this text is fairly complex and, and too complex for us to have time to go through it. But if you look at the diagram, I just want to point out a couple of key observations. One, the central duty of husbands to love their wives, remember whatever appears on the extreme left is the most prominent stuff in our diagrams. The instruction, husbands love your wives, is stated in verse 25. 
it's restated in verse 28 and it's restated in the summary in verse 33. So three times in our passage, Paul says to husbands, love your wives. Agapate, love your wives. Seldom does Paul repeat any instruction three times in one passage. I won't say he never does it, but I cannot offhand think of any other instruction that Paul repeats three times in one passage of Scripture. So there's something urgent and something passionate in this instruction. Husbands, love your wives. The first time Paul gives the command in verse 25, he develops it by means of a manner proposition, meaning he unpacks the answer to the question, how should I love my wife? And he gives the answer by comparison to Christ and the church. The answer is, how should we love our wives? We should love them as Christ loved the church. Presumably drawing on this image of self-serving, self-sacrificing, self-giving love instead of demanding selflessly and sacrificially loving wives. The second time he states it, in verse 28, he develops it not by means of a manner proposition, so he's not telling us how to love them. The second time he states it, he tells us why we should love them. It's a grounds or a basis that he gives for loving our wives. And the answer is the husband and wife are one flesh. Therefore, husbands should love their wives as they love their own body. So there's, there's a manner element, but the focus is on the fact that the husband and wife are one. And this challenges any notion of inherent superiority, dominance, etc. It's, it's we love our wives because and as our own bodies. And we'll leave it there. There's much more to be said, of course, about husbands and wives and, and a great deal of literature on this passage, but we need to park the bus at some point. So let's leave it there and move on to the other two groups, which Paul deals with much more succinctly in his household code. In chapter 6, he turns to children and parents. Children and parents. And because it's short, we're going to put one diagram with, with both the instructions to to the children and the parents together. So if you look at the diagram, we'll again make a few basic observations. Uh, once again, what's on the extreme right is most important. So you can see the pericope has two exhortations. There's one to children and there's one to parents. Children are told, obey your parents. Obey being a slightly stronger word than the word submit that was used when addressing wives. And this is presented as being the right thing to do. It's right, it's fitting, it's proper. And no one in the ancient world, hopefully no one in the modern Christian world, would question that that's right. And then this is developed by quoting the Ten Commandments to verify that, yes, God does indeed say this is right and fitting. So there's really nothing surprising in the instruction for parents, sorry, for children to love their parents. The second exhortation is an instruction to fathers representing parents, but maybe significant that it is specifically fathers. If there's nothing surprising in the instruction to children, there is definitely something countercultural in the instruction to fathers. Paul says, Fathers do not exasperate your children, but bring them up or nurture them, rear them in the training and instruction of the Lord. Greeks and Romans practiced harsh discipline of their children, almost in many cases to the point of brutal discipline. And Paul here is saying it should be different in the land of spirit-filled, in the household of spirit-filled people walking in the light of the gospel. That brutality has no place. So his primary instruction, hipateres me parorgizete ta tekna himon, fathers, do not exasperate your children, do not cause them to resent you, uh, is countercultural. Instead, says Paul, fathers should prefer the alternate way of child rearing, and he describes it as al ektrefete, literally, but feeding, nurturing, bringing up, caring for them en padia ke nuthesia kirio, but bringing them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So instead of harsh corporal discipline, Paul exhorts the Christian community, rather rear your children in understanding the ways of the Lord.
quite countercultural. And lastly, he turns to slaves and their masters. Slavery was simply a reality in the Greco-Roman world. To protest that Paul does nothing to campaign for abolition is frankly just to misunderstand the context in which he was ministering. Craig Keener, an eminent scholar on, on New Testament culture and backgrounds, says even a violent revolution could not have ended slavery in the Roman Empire. So the fact of the matter was that neither Paul nor the Ephesian church had any realistic power to challenge the status quo. They were masters and they were slaves and there was nothing that they could do about it. What Paul does do is to teach that disciples of Christ who are slaves or slave owners should be a different kind of human being. They should be spirit-filled slaves or slave owners. And he unpacks what that might look like for Christian slaves or slave masters living under the Roman Empire. Have a look at our diagram. Once again, on the right-hand side, you can see there are two main exhortations, one addressed to the slaves and the other one addressed to masters, i.e. slave owners. As we mentioned earlier, it would be surprising to give any kind of instruction about what a slave owner should do in terms of treating their slaves justly, fairly, righteously. So just the fact that there's a section on how to be a, a good master is countercultural. I want to make a few observations about what we see in this passage um, as reflected in the diagram. The first thing to note is that slaves had no option but to obey. So he begins by saying, slaves obey your masters. Now that was fair company. If you were a slave, you really had no option but to obey your master. So the act of obedience was not commendable. It was required and you simply couldn't not obey your master. So if you have a look at the diagram, what you're going to see is that aside from the opening line, slaves obey your masters, every other statement is a manner proposition. Every other statement is about the way, the attitude, the manner in which a Christian slave should obey their master. And so Paul unpacks it that a Christian slave should not only obey their master, they should obey in a way that is exemplary. And he gives a number of details as to what exactly that should look like. An exemplary work ethic, a good attitude, uh, being faithful even when your master is not watching. Paul introduces a surprising um, opportunity for Christian slaves right at the end of his instructions to slaves. So we've got the exhortation, slaves obey your masters, then a whole lot of manner propositions telling them the way in which they're to do that, the attitude, the spirit in which they're to do it. And then he ends with the result. And the result is that God will reward them for the manner in which they obey their masters. And, and, and the amazing turn is that if you're a Christian slave, even the way you conduct yourself as a follower of Christ in servitude is eternally rewarded by Christ. Paul's instructions to slave masters are completely countercultural. They're even more countercultural, I think, than his instructions to husbands were, although that's also a break with tradition. The main exhortation to masters is to avta piete prosavtus, literally do the same things to them. Now that begs the question, what same things? Of course, he's pointing up in the passage to the same kinds of things that are required from slaves in relation to their masters are required from slave masters by their master in relation to their slaves. So what things specifically is he talking about? What does he mean by do the same things to them? The primary instruction to slaves was that they should treat their masters as they would Christ. And he has the rub. He now tells slave masters, you do the same. You treat your slaves as you would treat Christ because they are his sons and daughters. He then gives a single specific about what exactly that should look like. And he tells them to stop threatening them. The language that's a present imperative doesn't always imply stopping something currently in progress. 
But in this passage, the present imperative is used to tell slave masters, Christian slave masters, you need to stop behaving like a non-Christian slave master. Stop treating your slaves harshly. Stop threatening them. Stop abusing your authority. And instead, as a servant of Christ, treat them as you would Christ. And then the code ends with the basis for that charge. Just as the masters are masters to their slaves, so they are slaves in relation to their master, God. And the idea is, do unto others as the, you want the Lord to do unto you. This brings us to the end of our household code. Paul has argued, in effect, that spirit-filled households look quite different to non-Christian households, that the impact of the gospel on the lives of those who are indwelt by his spirit is very significant. Although husbands, parents, and masters still have authority, it's transformed from self-serving to self-sacrificing. It's transformed from being God to those under their authority to being God's servants to those under their authority. Christ, in Paul's picture of this, Christ is Lord over all and all are servants of Christ and they are to manifest that in the way they treat one another. For husbands, this means loving their wives as Christ loved the church. For fathers, it means nurturing their children in the instruction of the Lord. And for masters, it means treating their slaves as equal human beings, equal in the eyes of God, fellow sons and daughters of the same Savior, doing to them the same things that they would expect their slaves to do in relation to them. Radically, radically countercultural. We've come to the end of Paul's instructions about how to walk in a manner that's worthy of our calling in Christ. He's talked about walking in unity, about walking as new creations, putting off the old and putting on the new, about walking as dearly loved children of God, and then in the last section, about how to walk as members of spirit-filled households, what that might look like in a way that honors our Lord and Savior. Before he signs off his letter to the Ephesians, there's one more thing that Paul wants to leave them with. And it's very strategic. He's aware that they come out of a background of fearing demonic powers and spirits. And so he wants to end his letter by telling them how to stand firm against the powers uh, of darkness are laid against them, how to put on the old armor of God, and how to overcome the wiles of the evil one. We'll talk about that in our last session.